is from Sari Havashari. Oh, thank you, Juan. Can I share my yeah, can I share my screen? Let me try screen share, screen share. Okay, neat. Can everyone see my screen and hear me? Yes. Cool, awesome, thank you. So I'm gonna turn my video off so we can stop looking at me and uh, look at my talk. So I'm gonna put this up. All right, so my talk is about an elephant, the stereotypical elephant in the room. And I'm gonna spend the next 10, 15 minutes going over the details of why embodiment is a pretty integral aspect of um, what you would call AGI. Okay, so um, I'm with the CS department at USC. All right, so this is pretty much our prototypical embodied elephant. You know, so pretty much for us in AI, the elephant is really our body. The, the reason for this talk and this paper is really the pretty straightforward observation that intelligence, biological intelligence, most certainly is embodied. So we have zero examples in nature of just brains free, freely floating around, just doing arbitrary computations with absolutely no body to take care of, it just never happens. And so then that is where this talk starts. Pretty much the traditional view of AI since basically the beginning is uh, intelligence is entirely situated, you know, in the head, so to speak. But in reality, biologically, like I just said, it's quite the opposite. The brain actually exists to pretty much help sustain the body that the brain lives in. And by sustain, it comes down to two basic things and other things like overlaid on top of that. Uh, the absolute basics is survival and then also reproduction. So that is brain's primary uh, purpose in nature. And so Rodney Brooks, who's a roboticist you know, at MIT, he's also the founder of uh, Roomba, like uh, uh, iRobot Corporation. So he has a very cool paper. He had a very cool paper way back in the, uh, I think in the 1990s, I'm gonna click on it. It is simply called Elephants Don't Play Chess. And uh, it's very cool considering like when it was written, see like back in 1990. And he makes very strong arguments against the classic uh, form of AI, especially back then, which is based on uh, symbol systems. So like symbolic computation. So he instead had an idea called uh, subsumption architecture, where it is not just entirely all top driven, top down driven, but even at the bottom layers, um, there's modules that basically know what to do with themselves. Pretty basic behaviors like run away from light or uh, avoid loud sounds and so on. So then his idea was more like a biology inspired you know, way to do AI, so to speak. So in that paper, this is what he says. Um, it's not that the elephant is not intelligent just because it doesn't play chess. So intelligence should not be, cannot be, um, uh, I guess, evaluated on like artificial toy domains, you know, that was his point. And he still makes the same point, And I believe in that point pretty strongly. Additionally, this notion of cognition uh, being embodied is not new at all. There's this notion in cognitive science called 4E, and the 4E stand for embodied and then embedded, where cognition is embedded in the environment. And the cognition is extended uh, based on the devices that we use, including smartphones, for example. And then cognition can also in turn make changes in the world. So we call it inactive. So that's the notion of 4A cognition and that goes back to at least 2010. But of that, just the embodied part is actually goes back all the way to the nineties, pretty much when um, Rodney wrote his paper. So it's not new at all, but in the AI community, um, embodiment is pretty much like a, a word to avoid because there's this uh, notion out there that intelligence does not need a body at all. Uh, if the body is needed, it is simply for input output. But I want to show that that is not quite the case. And so rather than repeat what's been done, I have like a new way of looking at it. And that involves this notion of a phenomenon, like physical phenomena that exist in the real world that is external to the agent. And how the agent then takes that phenomena and converts that to internal experience. So to me, intelligence is, is this interplay between what is on the outside versus what is on the inside from an agent's point of view. So I'm gonna start by telling you what phenomena is. 
So the universe, basically the, the physical world, is just filled with phenomena. Everything ultimately is a phenomenon. A ball, for example, rolls because it is spherical and there's gravity. And you bang on something that is flat and thin, it starts vibrating. And you heat water, it starts boiling. Likewise, you have a piece of glass prism, light rays refract through it. So these just happen all the time, whether there's humans to name them, measure them, look at them, study them or not, the universal. And there's possibly lots of phenomena that we still don't even know yet. For example, Einstein back in like 1900s wrote the paper about um, photoelectricity, electricity. And then now we have solar panels on our roofs. It's stuff like that. So before he came along and studied it, you know, there was obviously the phenomenon, but then he didn't name it and actually provide like an equation for it. Okay, so phenomena are out there. And phenomena in turn come from structures, which are just simply arrangement of matter, really. In fact, it's the arrangement of matter and also energy and also information. By information, I mean things like crystals, for example, have a specific orientation. DNA is double helix. So there's some information that goes into constructing those structures. So I call it information. All right, so structures are what give rise to phenomena. So phenomena loosely is behavior, how the matter behaves. Um, in material science, this is exactly how we approach everything. This is where you can look for new materials that exhibit a certain phenomena, for instance. So these structures and the phenomena, like we just mentioned, they involve things like self-organization um, and then transformation, say from one phase of matter to another, or even energy or material transport between these three things that I just mentioned. So phenomena are universal and they exist within us as well. So we sense the world and then we perceive the world inside our brains, all using phenomena. And it doesn't matter what type of sense we have or what type of senses other animals and insects might have. Ultimately, what is happening is they are all subject to phenomena. For example, eyes pretty much have this nice spherical lens here, and then light comes in, and then the optic nerves carries the signal all the way to the brain. It's all physics pretty much. And likewise, even the eardrum, just vibrates. So these are all physical structures. And that's exactly how hearing works. That little thing there, it's pretty much what conducts everything down to the brain. So it's fascinating how things work at that level. And then when things reach the brain, how do you perceive it? And how do you pay attention to it? That involves more complex phenomena, things like neurons conducting and the conduction being affected by chemicals called neurotransmitters and parts of the brain literally physically oscillating brain waves that we measure. And those oscillations, oscillations even travel from one brain region to another. So all kinds of phenomena ultimately are what are involved in the way we perceive and act in the world. And even the fact that we're alive is actually because of phenomena that happen in our body. Phenomena that we, a lot of times, don't have any conscious control over. Things like heartbeat, for example, that's just simply muscle twitching. And then this is like a fractal bunch of tubes that actually exchange like oxygen, carbon dioxide. Likewise, kidney dialysis, even just our standing up um, or heat thermal regulation, many, many, many things are just simply material phenomena that actually happen in our bodies. So life itself is ultimately a collection of phenomena that come from all these structures that uh, collectively keep us alive by definition. And uh, because if you're not alive, then you're gonna decay and that is entropy increase. So life basically uses energy, matter, information to create order that actually goes against the entropy increase as long as you know, we continue to live. So that's pretty interesting. It's phenomena all the way down. And um, yeah, so then this notion of experience. Classically in AI, people think that the word experience is pretty much a suitcase word. Well, that really means nothing, but it's actually quite the opposite. One way of looking at what is happening is that what we call experience is actually our direct using physical first-hand interaction with the environment in terms of just nothing but phenomena. For example, you see or hear glass breaking, maybe you're scared, you're probably gonna cut yourself, but that phenomena had to happen. Likewise, your shirt's rustling and it's because wind is blowing, that's phenomenon. Or your dog growls at you, that's phenomenon as well. So one way to look at the world and how we perceive it is all in terms of phenomena. And that phenomena is what we actually store in our heads as well. So this to me is a very, very important point. We actually represent phenomena inside us. First of all, we experience the phenomena, like I just said. So that is the actual experience of it. But then we actually store them in the form of memories, which is also called experience. And now it's a noun. And this is very specifically, I believe, what we do. 
So we look at objects, any object at all, a box, maybe, you know, a couple of floor, the sky. And objects are objects, inherently objects just are, but we perceive them in terms of objects properties. It's almost like objects have columns, features that we can measure, uh, like you know, machine learning or something. So those object properties, also known as qualities features, is exactly how we perceive the world. And those properties are what we store. For example, the rustling of a paper bag, or the fact that the paper bag has a, a hole in it and you can put your hand through it, or the fact that juicy apples, you bite into it and the liquid explodes and then you taste sweetness, or you invert like a coffee cup upside down and the coffee is going to spill. So all of these are just natural things that you know happen to us you know, that we see or experience. And then we call these memories, which can also change over time. And those memories are what we constantly use, even subconsciously, to uh, get through the world. So the main thing is, unlike AI, we absolutely do not learn these quantity, uh, qualities indirectly, secondhand. No one gives us data about how hot coffee, hot coffee means, or what is a slippery floor means. There's no rule for it, or there's no reinforcement learning necessary. We can learn just up to one time. Uh, whereas in AI, these are the three main forms of AI, uh, symbolic reasoning, connectionist AI and reinforcement learning, but we don't have all that because we have direct physical experience. So that is really the whole deal. Uh, once we experience and represent, most importantly, in our own terms, the physical world, then we can recall it anytime we want, we can reason about it. And we can even um, hypothesis, meaning the, the brain is like a, an, an expectation prediction machine, but the prediction is always possibly coming from us recalling our experiences. And further, this is actually pretty amazing to me. We can analogize between any object and any other object, for instance. We can abstract properties from a bunch of objects. We can group related things. We can transfer characteristics from one to another. Say you don't have a cup to drink water from. This cardboard box happens to lie around. I can temporarily possibly fill the box with water because I know that the both contain water. So I can just transfer the notion of a cup onto basically any object. We can even compose meanings by combining properties of multiple objects, or we can invent new uses for things. All of a sudden a stick, for example, might be used, you know, not just to like hit somebody, but also maybe to, I don't know, whack a mango. So we just make things up on the fly, these meanings. And these are magical as far as AI is concerned, because one thing that AI has never been able to do is exactly all of these. These are basically entirely off limits to AI. Maybe there's a reason for that because AI does all this secondhand so you have uh, James Gibson and then more recently Don Norman. So they are like behaviorist psychologists. So they have this notion of an affordance, but affordance is something that an object basically suggests to a person. Like a, a cup basically says, hold me because the cup has a handle, you naturally reach for it. Likewise, um, Von Yushko, he has a theory of meaning, it's called Umwelt, where the agents vary body and brain architecture, the way an insect or a human is put together is exactly what results in that insect or human experience in the world physically in terms of you know their bodies really. So what I'm saying has a relation to all of that. It's all about us being embodied and the environment also has phenomena. It's all exchange in terms of phenomena. It's basically almost nothing else really. So AI then without physical embodiment is the classic AI we have in the world today. And so there's three ways to do it. We make up rules which you call symbolic reasoning, uh, you know, logical reasoning, knowledge representation, all of that. Or we provide massive amounts of data that we label, and then it does like neural network learning and it starts predicting these days we can generate data as well, but gains, that's connection is the AI. And then you can have goals for them in some kind of artificial environment, and then they can uh, be used to meet, they can be made to uh, meet the goals using reinforcement, reward punishment. So then if you do that, there's one massive problem though, then such an AI that is driven by rules, data, or goals, they're not functioning in our world at all. They're actually functioning in some kind of derivative world that sadly we created for them because we've become the intermediary between the actual real physical environment and this, this AI right there. So there's some problems with doing that. First of all, it is our rules, our data, our goals, not the AIs. And then much, much more importantly, it is our representation. In classic convolutional neural networks, an image is the basic image that you would train a neural network with. It's simply a collection of pixels, okay, with RGB values, right? But that is not what the real world is all about. So we inserted our representation and then we forced the AI to deal with it. 
So in a way that is a crazy way to think about it is maybe you are creating this fake simulation of this phenomena rich structure based physical world. And the simulation is not perfect in any way at all because simulations by definition can be incomplete because we don't understand how nature works. It might even be blatantly incorrect, some phenomena we represent and inadequate because we cannot possibly track the state of everything that happens in VR, for example. So you would need to simplify. So the real life counterparts are much richer and so then, you know, in AI, we basically sacrifice all of that for computation. So the computation itself might be a problem, for example. Maybe our brains don't compute the way digital computers compute. So Rodney Brooks, whom I mentioned earlier, just last year, less than a year ago, he said uh, he had an article in IEEE Spectrum, uh, cognition without computation is what he called it. So he said, I'll just come out and say it. I don't think the brain computes at all. It's bluntly the way he put it. You know, that's a speculation, but I tend to believe that as well. And so I also believe that this is really the single root cause for all of AI's problems. AI is spectacularly amazing when it comes to narrow deep domains, it works every single time, but we have never been able to combine them in any meaningful way at all. But I think that is the reason because we're not letting the AI operate in the real world. Yeah, so then again, what is the problem with doing that? The problem is the meaning that the AI gets by doing all these computations is literally not grounded. We talk about grounded meaning. There's also the so-called frame problem, which is the, the information knowledge that we give the AI is all that it'll ever know. It's boxed in a frame. It cannot look outside the frame. It's all a secondhand pretty much. So for instance, an AI that knows all about text, uh, it doesn't know about the world. And so, what it knows is simply how words are strung together, but not necessarily what words mean. So these days you have GPT-3 and many more language models. So what they learn is actually things like word order, statistical word order, or grammar, not what actual words mean. For example, looking up, you know, you're so important, I'm looking up to you. Or wow, it's so amazing, you hit it out of the park, you know? You know your explanation can be you know, clearer than day and night. So these things really mean nothing at all. For that matter, any object, any action, and any characteristics that are associated with them are all pretty much real world, except for some abstract nouns, you know, that are like philosophical. But mostly the objects and things we talk about in the world, they mean really zero to an AI because the meaning is not in those words at all. The meaning is in the experience that we get from those words. So you and I would know what that means because we live through day and night, but not AI. So these days you have things like stable diffusion and mid journey and all these AI generators. So here's one of the images quite recently that one of them made. So this designer said, uh, make a coffee cup with many holes. And then, you know, comically, tragically, this is what the AI made. It's nice to have a cup with holes, it looks pretty, but the sad part is it actually put coffee in it with zero coffee spilling out because AI has no clue, it computes pixels one at a time using RGB. So this 80 year old made this obvious comment because the 80 year old lives in the world. And I think that is a problem. The AI does not live in the world. Okay, so moving on, the solution then would be pretty simple, which is simple conceptually, but probably pretty hard to do. So we would need to make actual physical body and brain architecture, not even virtual for the reason that I mentioned because the virtual world is much less rich than the, the real world. So if you make an actual biological looking, you know, anthropomorphic or not, uh, an object like a, a being, then that can directly interact with the world. That means there's no human intermediary. And so that is the architecture we need to be creating. In other words, don't program AI using TensorFlow, but instead create some kind of brain body architecture that lets the AI learn and also represent the world by itself. It doesn't matter if the representation is incorrect, but still it is its own representation. And then over time, maybe it can correct it. So then that is the holy grail, this whole grounded meaning. And there's only one way to get it in my opinion. You have to actually physically have agents. It, they don't have to look like um, you know, human robots and they don't even have to be human level AI. It would be much simpler, like little insects, for example, but the architecture would still let them be their own kind of insects, so to speak. So subsumption that, Rodney Brooks did back in the 90s was an early example of that. So they made like lots of robots using the subsumption idea. And they're all pretty much uh, along the lines of what I'm talking about. These days we have this new notion of developmental robotics where people are slowly starting to get this realization that maybe the AI has to live in the world after all, stuff like that. But to me, even these don't go too far, but maybe there are some kind of a start. 
because it is not um, adequate for the AI to have a hard shell, for example. It probably needs to have pliable soft skin like we do. Uh, nature evolved us the way we look for, for a certain reason. So when we get to human level embodied, embodied agents like that, so the architecture is probably going to be pretty advanced. You need to have maybe plastic electronics with the sensors like all over. And then brain plasticity, this is a very big one because this representation that it makes on its own needs to be possibly modified. Like whereas autopoiesis where it can pretty much grow on its own using some kind of energy material input, not be dependent on humans to swap out its operating system. And then homeostasis, again, it should be able to take care of itself. Say it gets injured, should know how to seek help. And all that comes only when it has things like fear of like not wanting to get hurt. So these are not very different from how we're put together. But then the point is you would need to make some kind of a, a synthetic version of us. So then once again, just to summarize why is embodiment such a big deal? Because it is these four letters, D, P, uh, I, C, direct, physical, interactive, where you can examine an object in any direction you want, throw it up in the air, break it. And also continuous learning. And there's also multi-sensory for sure, where you learn from many different senses. And also, um, you have a sense of your own internal organs that is called interception. Uh, embodiment provides it. Likewise, you have a sense of space. You probably have place cells to represent space, but you also have a sense of yourself in space that is proprioception. And then you have a sense of time. So this is a very interesting thought, which is we would know about time because in the real world, unlike VR even, phenomena are ir uh, irreversible. If a robot drops a coffee cup and the cup breaks, then nothing in the universe can put it back together. Whereas in VR, I could save all that state and run time backwards. So it's really not real in some sense, but in the real world, something getting damaged is real. So then that's a sense of time passage. Likewise, if you have a body, you see some other body, just like you're doing something, you can naturally imitate that. It's called imitation learning. Likewise, if you see a body just like you get hurt, somebody's screaming, and then you can empathize with their pain because you know, you'll probably feel the same pain. That's where empathy comes from. And then this is also extremely important. When you have a body based on all of these, we start to represent the world. So even two bodies that start in the same house, the same block, maybe the same bed twins, they could start having diverging representations based on what happened to them or what came before what. So everybody then has a chance to develop their own version of intelligence, just like humans. And embodiment is the only thing that's gonna provide that. Otherwise we'll have Dilbert, that TensorFlow trains, all self-driving cars do the exact same thing, for example. But this is the opposite of that. So humans ourselves, we humans uh, have evolved, you know, to be embodied. So this is my theory of how humans basically took over the universe. So first of all, your embodiment, and like I said, because of our advanced brain architecture, we can represent anything by ourselves. And more importantly, we invented language, math, art, floor plans, uh, machine, you know, diagrams, anything at all, symbols, music notations, to help us get these representations from outside us, from us to outside, and then communicate it. The right books teach, you know, text message, so I could transmit. So we transfer one representation, like from my head to your head, for example. So collectively, that is, I think, what made us all be, who, you know, who we are. And then further, we also have again our brain power to look at nature the natural structures and phenomena and do things like biomimetics. And then we exploit the phenomena for our purposes. That is literally the definition of engineering, which is exploiting phenomena for useful, useful gain. And then we all save all science because of all of that. And because of science, we can use instruments to see things that are so small, so large, and so useful, molecular dynamics, uh, virus structure. So when you have an agent that is unembodied or even virtually embodied, it pretty much misses out on everything. Sorry, one minute more. Yeah, yeah, thank you, I'll, I'll wrap up. So yeah, it has no spatial scale to use as a reference, nothing at all. So all of what I said is entirely missing for this AI. So my last point would be, would such an AI be analog or digital? So my answer would be, it would have to be analog because then there's parity with the world because the world is all analog anyway. When you make it digital, then it becomes about Python interpreters and Linux operating system, you know, and clock cycles and GPUs, which are entirely so uh, foreign to the, the natural world. So maybe it should be analog. And analog also would lead to symbolless computation. There's a very big deal because you have a digital timer that is perfect, but this kitchen timer that has got a spring, there's no symbols at all, but we can still compute. So maybe our brains are very similar. The mechanism itself is a computer. 
So maybe analog computers are actually better than digital computers when it comes to embodiment. So then my conclusion is intelligence has to be embodied, which then gives it experience and possibly with an analog brain. So therefore the conclusion is embodiment matters. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, questions? Uh, if I may, I, I would ask you. Uh, I would ask. I would uh, ask you a question. Uh, as far as I understand, um, you say that um, meaning uh, um, is uh, must be uh, related to external uh, sensing. Uh, is it true? Yeah, for the most part, it is true. I mean, there are abstract terms, you know, obviously things like death, for example. But even those somehow get related to the outside world. So I think yeah, my short answer is yes. And well, um, well let's consider an example. Uh, these days, I'm struggling with uh, a categorist theory, which is uh, well, the most abstract theory uh, in mathematics. Well, um, uh, and um, uh, I'm studying, well, just say, conjunction. And uh, I'm trying to, to uh, understand the meaning of this uh, concept. Uh, and um, well, uh, as I feel, uh, I have no uh, related ex uh, external uh, experience with uh, with this uh, with this uh, concept. Uh, but uh, as I think, I'm well, just trying to to reach the the meaning or to understand the meaning of this concept. Uh, how do you um, explain this uh, situation? Yeah, yeah. So I must correct myself, you know, I would never definitely say that everything that we ever conceive in our brains um, is all like physically based external. That's not at all true. In mathematics, simply the notion of inverse or square root or something, right? They have no physical analogs you can directly point to. So I think our brains somehow, this is somehow because I don't know how, are capable of pure symbolic reasoning. I mean, that is what math is all about. So those don't have inherent meaning except for the symbols you're manipulating. So, but my point is that at the base level, uh, it's almost like a pyramid where things are based on something and then you can build high levels. So I think the base level, things like space, time, matter, gravity, those would have to be experienced embodied. But yeah, we can definitely build all kinds of cool structures on top of that. Those don't necessarily involve external objects or embodiment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I understand you. Thank you very much. Thank you.